three, as you can see, two definitions or two, really it's two types of propaganda. Uh, and of the hundreds of serious scholars who have worked on propaganda in our time, the most famous is probably Noam Chomsky, and uh, who was a professor at MIT, the other MIT, um, in 1988, published uh, with Edward Herman, Manufacturing Consent. And I'm sure you've encountered Chomsky before. And for our purposes, um, there is a piece of his propaganda model, which is going to be helpful to us because um, much of it is about the ownership and control of the media. Uh, it, I mean, it's helpful to us at MIT. And uh, which would now have to include things like internet portals, IPs, and uh, internet service providers, ISPs, and all the people who are producing big data and people who are, who are scraping big data and people who are Google and oh, it's all that stuff. So that's political economy. I don't do it. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't go there. <laughs> so anyway, here's the Chomsky propaganda model. Uh, okay, so just in case you're like, what was it again? That was second year, Tim. I have no memory of second year. It's like, okay, <laughs> here's the little clip. Okay. And uh, the ideological system. When we talk about manufacturing of consent, whose consent is being manufactured? We, we can, to start with, there are two different groups. We can get more into more detail. But at the first level of approximation, there's two targets for propaganda. One is what's sometimes called the political class. There's maybe 20% of the population, which is relatively educated, more or less articulate. Uh, that plays some kind of role in decision-making. Uh, they're supposed to sort of participate in social life, either as managers or cultural managers, like, say, teachers and writers and so on. They're supposed to vote. They're supposed to play some role in the way economic and political and cultural life goes on. Now, their consent is crucial. It's one group that has to be deeply indoctrinated. Then there's maybe 80% of the population uh, whose main function is to follow orders and not to think, you know, and not to pay attention to anything. And they're the ones who usually pay the cost. All right, Professor Chomsky, no, um, you outlined a model with filters that propaganda is uh, sent through. That's way to the public. Can you briefly outline those? It's basically an institutional analysis of the major media, what we call a propaganda model. We're talking primarily about the national media, those media that sort of set a general agenda that others more or less adhere to, to the extent that they even pay much attention to uh, national or international affairs. Now, the elite media are the sort of the agenda-setting media. That means the New York Times, the Washington Post, the major television channels, and so on. They set the general framework. The local media more or less adapt to their structure. World news. It doesn't sound like it says that there's a beachhead. I think. I think. I think six by the eight is a good one. Yeah, but I think. I think. I think six. Good start. This is the operative sound bite for us. He's out. He barely knows how to time. He's got a minute for all the time. So that's. I love this sound bite. Okay. And they do this in all sorts of ways by selection of topics, by distribution of concerns, by emphasis and framing of issues, by filtering of information, by bounding of debate within certain limits. Two and a half minutes to it. No. 45 seconds. They determine, they select, they shape, they control, they restrict uh, in order to serve the interests of dominant elite groups in the society. There is an unusual amount of attention focused today on the five nations of Central America. This is Democracy's Diary. Here, for our instruction, are triumphs and disasters, the pattern of life's changing fabric. Here is great journalism, a revelation of the past, a guide to the present, and a clue to the future. I'd like to ask you a question essentially about the methodology in studying the propaganda model and how would one go about doing that? Well, there are a number of ways to proceed. 
uh, uh, one obvious way is to try to find more or less paired examples. Uh, so, uh, uh, some of this thinking that, that Chomsky comes away with and Herman, I, we always forget Herman. Everyone just says Chomsky, oh yeah, people go, oh yeah, propaganda model, there's manufacturing kinetics. It's like, yeah, and Herman, <laughs> who was the co author. Uh, but anyway, um, a lot of this kind of thinking is based in the work of French philosopher of technology, a sociologist, a theologian named Jacques Ellul. And do I have a, yes, I do. I have a slide which I can, where I can show you his name. <clears throat> now, again, this is a name that you may be familiar with. I'll just minimize myself. Okay, I'll let you take this stuff down if you wish. I will, while well, I'm paused here, <laughs> I'll just do whatever people do when they're paused. I'm just buffering. Okay, so Elul wrote his famous book, Propaganda. These are two, if you're in an MIT -er and you're not, uh, and political economy is not your baby, these are two good places to, two good things to read because it's they're very readable. He's a systematic, he's a systematic sociologist who goes through like, this is what happens and then this, this, this. very useful. And he, uh, comes up with uh, these two different, well, really these are, it's not that he comes up with them, but um, these are two sort of famously known different forms of propaganda. Agitation propaganda, which is just called agitprop, and integration propaganda. And this is, <clears throat> this is Alol's creation, integration propaganda. Agitation propaganda um, is the easiest kind and the easiest one to see because it is the kind of thing you've been seeing for the last nearly four years now with the Trump administration. The Make America Great Again um, brand, really, it sort of stays just a brand until you start to say to people, there's a caravan of uh, rapists and murderers uh, who are coming from Honduras and Ecuador and uh, Guatemala and Brazil and <clears throat> they're coming and they're coming to rape your daughters and steal your jobs and okay uh, you know so it's like we need to build a wall and okay that's agitation propaganda because you're trying to get people upset about something that's going to happen and keep them upset long enough to put you in power or get a job done. Basically. So the wall is not really very important particularly, and it's certainly not a good way of, of solving this particular problem if, you, if what you see is that you've got a problem with um, immigration. Um, building a wall is one of the stupidest things to do. But the thing about the wall is it's nice and visible, and you're like, ha, ah, wall, and it's a symbol. So it's like, okay, great. So it, it makes good uh, optics, basically for agitation propaganda. So agitation propaganda is focused on, so really you just have to think about Hitler, and Hitler was all about agitation propaganda. Uh, well, Goebbels certainly was, and so was Hitler. And if you remember, say, the Nuremberg rallies, but the sort of famous Nuremberg rally, torchlight parades, uh, the waving of the Confederate flag at a KKK rally, um, these are all very exhilarating for the people who are involved in them. I mean, it, it's horrifying for the rest of us. We're like, oh, God, this is awful. You know what? Stop. Um, but the people who are involved are brought into this high state of exaltation and excitement. And they willingly, this is one of the deals, like people think, why do they do that? It's like, because it's a thrill. You're giving up who you are in exchange for getting the power of the mass. So it's an enormously powerful thing to do. It's kind of like going to a political rave in some ways. Um, except that it doesn't stop. Like you don't, you're like, oh, the next morning you're like, oh God, you know, why did I go, <laughs> why did I go to the rave? Oh, I took all that E, you know, it was bad for my, oh my, now I got to drink water for two days and you kind of stumble around. But agitation propaganda isn't like that. It doesn't stop if it keeps on burning and you keep on, on, you keep on having a fire in you, you get up the next morning and you're kindled again. And it doesn't, this is a high that doesn't burn out. Eventually it does. You can keep agitation propaganda going for very long. I'm talking about more than a couple of years, really, because people just get tired. They're like, okay, 
I, I need to go home and just like watch the American voice or whatever, the voice, whatever they call it. You know, and you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't watch it. <laughs> Something like that. You know, I got to go home and watch my favorite YouTuber. Okay. Or my favorite influencer. I got to follow them on Twitter. Okay. So, but agitation propaganda is what happens during election season. And if the team is lucky, then you get a nice nationalistic thing that occurs at the same time, like the Olympics, for instance. Olympics are all about agitation propaganda, getting people whipped up into a frenzy about how good their nation is and how bad every other nation is. My whole, okay, <laughs> I'm very, very nervous and unhappy. Oh, now I'm frozen again. Wake up, Tim, wake up. There we go. Uh, <laughs> I'm very nervous about the Olympics. I, I think that this, any excuse for nationalism is probably bad news. Uh, yeah, I know people are going to hate that. They're like, oh, you know, the Olympics. Oh, so you're against the Olympics. So it's like, I'm against nationalizing excellence because it's bad for everybody. But anyway, um, the implicit uh, way that this functions, that agitation propaganda functions, is that people are excluded. Sometimes it's very explicit. It's like, they are not human beings. We exclude them. Asian Americans, uh, African Americans, Americans of any color, uh, Americans who practice this religion or that religion or who wear these clothes uh, or who practice the, have these sexual preferences. They're not American. Okay, whatever. So we're all used to that. In other words, you're not a person. And there are both implicit understandings about that and explicit understandings. The implicit understanding is that if you're inside the group, it makes you feel fantastic. And if you're outside, you're like, how come I'm outside? And you're in danger. Okay, so that's agitation propaganda, all right? 